Hey everyone, Sarah here, and welcome back for part two of the Closures and Fasteners episode. In this episode, you're gonna learn about some snaps, a couple different hook and eyes, some eyelets, grow mitts, magnets, Velcro, buttons, and some button holes, though not exactly in that order. There is a ton of information to learn, so I'm gonna to try to make it as short and sweet as possible. Try to bear with me though, and feel free to skip around to the sections that you need by following the index in the description below. First thing you want to do is make sure your fabric is either doubled up or that you have some kind of stabilizer underneath. If not, your fabric won't have the strength it needs to pull this off, unless, of course, you're working with some thick denim or canvas. Having a thicker fabric or some stabilizer is really gonna help anchor in that eyelet. This tool I have in my hand is an owl. It's kind of the trick to making sure your eyelet is installed easily and neatly. Come up from the right side of the fabric and use that sharp point to poke through all the layers of the fabric. Just be careful because this point is very sharp. So perhaps if you are accident prone, some gloves. See that nice hole it forms? The fabric will have a little lip that protrudes outward and that's what we want. Now take that protruding end of the eyelet and pop it up through that hole from the bottom or from the right side of the fabric. This takes a little maneuvering, so I like to use my owl to help out a little bit. I can kind of wiggle the fabric onto the protruding metal piece and really work those edges. See how a little bit of the red is sticking out? That's the protruding part of the eyelet coming through. Now, using the point of my owl, I can push the fabric phrase down a bit onto the eyelet just so it fits better and everything is kind of smushed and condensed. Now place some fray check over those loose fibers and allow it to dry. Go ahead and grab your pliers. This is a Dritz plier set. We have it on our site if you wanna check it out some more. I'll refer to each of these parts as A, B, and C, just because it's easier for me to explain and honestly for me to remember. So I have part C engaged. This is specifically for eyelets. Insert the prong, that little part that's sticking up through the eyelet, and squeeze really hard. It's going to smash that metal protruding lip so that it kind of folds over. And there you go, an easy eyelet. You can have a lot of fun with this and always feel free to experiment and see what you can come up with. This is technically called a large eyelet, but it's basically the same thing as a grommet. Technically a grommet is for heavy fabric like sailing canvas, but tomato, tomato. This is the kit it comes with. So here's what you do. Same as with an eyelet, mark your hole and stick the owl through because this is a large quote unquote eyelet. We'll go down the whole length of the owl just to make the hole really large. Take the metal piece that has the tall protruding lip and place it in the hole, just as we did with the eyelet. Apply some fray, check again and allow to dry. Now place the metal on top of the black piece. The black piece has indents to which the metal fits very nicely and center it as best as you can. Place the other thinner metal piece on top. This piece also has a lip, which should be facing up, but see it's just not as tall as the other, as the other piece's lip. I kind of think of it as like a washer. Now take this piece and hammer it all together. Don't go wreck it Ralph on it, but don't be gentle either, kind of like hammering a nail in a drywall. This flattens out those lips on top of each other, which secures everything in place. There you go, all finished, super easy, nice and neat. A snap is made of four parts. You've got the post and the socket and the caps for each, which have those sharp open prongs on the end. Now caps come in a ton of decorative options, many with beautiful designs. Today, we're gonna keep it simple. This is the pliers tool again. Turn the bottom so that part B is engaged. If you don't already have the rubber holders on, pop those little guys in place. They help hold the prong and the snap in place while you're installing so it's not slipping and sliding around or falling out. So just wiggle them on. You want both the top and the bottom rubber installed. Take the socket and place it in part B. This part is a little confusing, but if you look closely, you can see that one of the sides has a lip that protrudes a little bit out. That is the side that should be facing up. Now take that sharp prong cap and place it in part A. The prongs should be sticking out. 
Now these little prongs sure can stab your fingers a bit when placing them in the holder, but no one said DIY was pain free. Once again, you can see I have this flap folded. Just like with our eyelet installation, you need to either have some stabilizer under your fabric or the fabric should be doubled over. If you don't, the snaps will fall out. I learned this the hard way, trust me, anchor that baby down with some layers. So all you do is just squeeze together tightly. Now for the other side, let's say this is the center front of a shirt with snaps instead of buttons. This time, the prong cap will go in part B and the post will go in part A. The protruding metal should not be showing. It should be installed with the post facing the inside of the tool. I'm just going to overlap these to see where the other part of my snap should go. Place a little mark on the outside of the garment. This is where my decorative cap will show. Squeeze again and there you go, snaps installed. Very easy and very effective. There are many fasteners that can be sewn by hand. Most commonly, you'll see hook and eye and hand sewn snaps. Though these are very easy to attach, they're often very time consuming. So, hook and eye. This kind of hook and eye is often seen at the top of dresses and skirts, right above the zipper, especially with invisible zippers. For a hook and eye, you really wanna pay attention to placement. The hook will be hidden and should not protrude past the seam. The eye can be lined up with the seam or slightly off the edge of the seam. Using a double threaded needle, attach the hook at these points and the eye at these points. You are often sewing these to a lining or even to a long strip of ribbon separately so that the stitches don't show on the right side of the fabric. This is another hook and eye combination. It's very strong. I used these in my beaded strap tutorial and they worked wonderfully in securing the straps to the side of the dress. Generally, I like to have the hook hidden, so I put this piece on the wrong side of the fabric. The eye is a little more subtle looking, so I'll have it be the piece that is sewn on the right side of the fabric. Using a double threaded needle, attach the hook at these points and the eye at these points. A hand sewn snap is attached just as it looks. With a double threaded needle, tack down all of these points on the post and on the socket. The trick with these hand sewn fasteners is knowing how to hide the thread as you pass it from one tacking point to the next. I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but I like to try to hide my thread by passing it under the actual snap or hook just so that it's not exposed on the outside. That's kind of the trick and you'll play around and you'll figure it out. These magnets are super easy, but beware, don't stick those suckers together until they're actually sewn on the fabric. Yeah, this, this took a while. So anyways, the package says to press the prongs into the fabric to create an indentation, but I can't see that. So let's go the smart -er route and mark where the prongs are. Now fold the fabric in half and snip a tiny little cut, just, just a nip. Slide the prongs through and pop on the backing piece. Just a note, because this is thick vinyl, I'm not gonna use any stabilizer, but if I were using any kind of lighter fabric, go with a stabilizer. These magnets are heavy and really need that extra support. Simply bend the prongs outward, use pliers if needed, repeat on the other side, and you're finished. You see these often on purses and the magnet backings are kind of hidden within the lining. However, you can buy decorative magnet backings if you wanna forego that whole lining business. Sew on magnets are just as easy. It's just a matter of sewing a square. Now first, make sure your placement is set up so that the magnets won't oppose each other. There's nothing worse than sewing a magnet and realizing they won't connect. Then with a 9014 or even size 100 needle, universal, and a standard presser foot, you can slowly sew along the border of the magnet. It's also a good idea to increase your stitch length and decrease your tension to accommodate that extra bulk. 
repeat with the other magnet, and bam, you just sewed yourself some magnets. Here we have some nice white Velcro. This is the sew on variety, however, Velcro does come in sticky back and iron on. This stuff is super easy to attach once you know a trick or two. First, cut the length you need with the two pieces stuck together. This way you can guarantee both strips are equal. Now round out those really pointy corners. Those things can get pretty sharp. To get an accurate placing of the Velcro on the fabric, you don't really want to use pins. The Velcro is so tough and it doesn't really bend well with the pins. So instead, use some basting spray to hold the Velcro in place while you sew it on. If you don't have basting spray, no big deal. You can always hand baste in place. Using your general purpose foot and a 9014 needle, sew around all those edges. One eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch is fine. Put down your needle, lift your presser foot and pivot around those corners and continue until all four sides are attached. Repeat the same steps on the other piece of Velcro and you're all finished. Super easy, right? Now let's make a buttonhole and sew a button by hand. First, we need to mark the placement. If you're using a pattern, it will have the markings indicated where the buttonhole should go already. If you aren't using a pattern, you can just eyeball it by grabbing your button and visualizing where you would like it to poke through the buttonhole when everything is finished. Once you have the center of the button marked, you can measure the length of the buttonhole by marking the length of your button and adding about an eighth of an inch to each side. That way you know the hole is big enough for the button to squeeze through. For all those perfectionists out there, you can grab a seam gauge and test the measurements to make sure both are even. Then adjust if you need. Pin that positioning in place and test the fit. This is a romper in process for my son, so I need to test to make sure that the button placement doesn't shorten the romper or that it doesn't make it too long. So let's just pretend the fitting went well. Now let's mark where the actual buttons will be sewn. I like to use my seam gauge to line those up. Again, for the perfectionists out there, you can test the measurements are symmetrical with the seam gauge. To save time, I double thread my needle by tying the two ends of the thread together. This way, I don't have to sew as many passes. We're going to hide the knot under the button so your first stitch will be on the top of the fabric. Then pass the needle through the hole on the button. You don't want your button to be snug on the fabric. It has to have a bit of give so that the button hole can be looped around it. So place a large hand sewing needle or toothpick between those two holes. Sew back and forth on top of the toothpick or sewing needle, whatever you're using. You only need to do this three to five times because you double threaded your needle. After that, you can bring the needle up to the front of the fabric again, but don't pass it through the needle hole. Instead, bring it off to the side and wrap it around the base of the button about three times. This provides additional ease. Pass the thread to the back of the fabric. Sew a few stitches on the back. And you can cut the thread here if you want, or if you know this button is going to get a ton of abuse, pass the needle up through the top again and guide it through those threads at the base of the button for a little extra security. These days, we most often sew a buttonhole on the machine with either the four-step buttonhole foot or the one-step buttonhole foot. We can also use our machine to sew on a button with this little foot. Since most economy beginner sewing machines have a four-step buttonhole, we'll learn how to sew with that one. More advanced machines have a one-step buttonhole foot, which is easier and faster, but the feature costs a little more. If you have a one-step buttonhole machine, watch our video on how to use the one-step buttonhole foot. I have the link in the description below. Before we start anything, make sure that bobbin has sufficient thread in it. You do not want to run out of thread mid buttonhole. Bring the slider all the way up to the front so that those little red lines match and snap the foot in place. I'm a big fan of stabilizing my buttonholes. It works great as an extra bit of support and I find that the buttonhole just lasts longer with the stabilizer. Remember, this is where I marked my buttonhole by measuring the button before. Line the presser foot up with the mark that is closest to your body. Try to line up those little red lines with the marking you made. By the way, always test your buttonhole settings first on a scrap piece of fabric. 
It is such a pain to seam rip a buttonhole. So now let's sew this. Select the A pattern on your stitch dial. On some machines, this is also a number one. And sew six to 10 stitches. Lift the needle to the highest position and switch to the B or number two stitch on your machine. The machine is supposed to basically sew backwards, but if your feed dogs are being a pain, you might have to slightly tug to help the fabric along and sew until you reach the other buttonhole marking. Lift your needle to the highest position and select the C or three stitch, which is exactly the same as the A stitch. And sew six to 10 stitches again. Bring your needle to the highest position and select the D stitch. Sew until it reaches the first stitches you sewed. To lock the threads in place, select a straight stitch. Drop the needle down, pivot your fabric 90 degrees, and sew over those first few stitches. And remember to back tack. Now use your seam ripper to carefully slice open the fabric. Pay extra attention not to rip into those stitches. Flip over the fabric and trim the stabilizer. Repeat on any remaining buttonholes, and you are finished. So now let's sew on a button using our sewing machine. I like to use a stabilizer on the wrong side of my fabric to add a little more strength. It helps prevent the button from falling off as easily, though it is definitely not required. I just love me some stabilizer. Press it down and smooth it out. Now we can sew on the button. So go to your machine and grab your darning plate. I'm going to pop the two prongs on the darning plate into the two corresponding holes on the needle plate. Make sure that the opening is right underneath that needle. More advanced machines have what's called a drop feed dog lever or switch so that you don't even need to use a darning plate. If your machine didn't come with a darning plate, we have tons on our site to choose from. Now take your sew on button foot and place it under the shank and snap it on. It will click easily into place. Place my fabric underneath the button. Test to make sure that my needle will not hit the button. I'm on a zigzag stitch right now. I see that my needle does protrude the buttonholes nicely. It's not going to contact the plastic and break. That would be bad. No good for flying sharp objects. So six to 10 stitches back and forth. You'll see the needle hop back and forth. Now you can knot off the back if you want a little extra security, but you certainly don't have to. And there you go. You just sewed on a button with your machine. Sometimes buttonholes turn out ugly. So to combat some of those ugly stitches, I recommend applying water soluble stabilizer on top of the fabric as you sew or tissue paper. I also prefer to use a top stitching needle and embroidery thread because I think it gives it a better finish. I think it looks nice and neat. If you do both of those and your results are still iffy, play with the tension. With my fabric stabilizer and thread choices, I had the best results when I lowered my tension setting to two. Some machines, including this one, have a fine adjustment setting. The problem is it's not very intuitive to use and it secretly hates everything. It only adjusts the stitch length of the right seam, AKA the D stitch. So the idea is to adjust this little knob so that the D stitch matches the B stitch in stitch length. So in a nutshell, it only adjusts the stitch length of stitch D. So very helpful. Just note, when adjusting this, you can get some good results. It really can make things look a little neater if you play around with it on that scrap fabric, but only move it about a millimeter at a time because it is very sensitive. Now, I know this was a lot of information, so if you have any comments or questions, be sure to leave them in the comment section below or come and visit the sewing community at sewingpartsonline.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash sewingpartsonline, Twitter at sewingparts. Google Plus, Pinterest, or Instagram, we're everywhere. And be sure to subscribe by hitting that button below for next week's sewing video.